All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our June Rail and Transit Committee meeting. Good to have full house. <laughs> no conflict. <laughs> no conflict this morning. So the first thing on our agenda is to um, get approval of our May 17th minutes. So move. Second. Yes, I know I do have to call the judge. I'm trying to write down because we have trouble hearing on the recording. So, so that makes sure that we've got it in the notes. All right. So, all those in favor? Aye. I'm going to abstain. She were not here. Right. Well, we're glad you're back. Yes, we are glad I'm back. You are too. Absolutely. So I'll start off with director's update for today's um, just quick overview of today's board meeting. Um, we do have uh, we have a rail industrial access project that you were briefed on last month that's on the action agenda, as well as our six year program and budget. And then we have uh, a rail industrial access presentation on the workshop. It's one presentation that's actually four projects. I think this is the size the most we've ever taken in one month. <laughs> so you'll see a, a little different presentation style on those projects as we combine them all together so that you can see them there all, all in one. So the, the pipeline is filling up. The pipeline is filling up. Um, you know, very focused on economic development. Uh, Emily Stock and her team are working with the uh, Virginia Economic Development Partnership uh, to help make sure we've got rail ready sites and we're having that dialogue with BDP that you'll see reflected in the freight portion of the rail plan later this year. So good things happening on the rail side for, for freight and helping with economic development. And I'm going to switch to transit. I feel like I've got a good news. Last month's report wasn't so filled with good news. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm focused on good news this morning. We did get good news on Friday. Uh, we were awarded a federal discretionary grant. Um, it is the PCAM. I can. I can. Integrated. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. So we're getting $100,000 from FTA. This will help us take our transportation navigator, which is our technology platform that we presented in the subcommittee uh, last, late last year. Uh, this is, enables us to do a lot of things with information and data and reach the public. This will let us take it to the next level. So that's being matched with uh, funds from ITTF. And so we're excited to hear, uh, hear that we have been awarded that funding. On the ridership side, um, we are continuing to see transit ridership increasing um, month over month. Um, April was up 3% over March. So those little incremental changes, they add up over time. Um, the services with the largest increase in ridership between March and April were heavy rail. That's this is more well, my, on the transit side. Oh, we're talking about Vamata. 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 Okay. We're talking about Vamata. and so that's another positive sign. So what are the numbers now? Mm -hmm. It's just total. total. Yeah. You, you, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are we about forty percent right now? Yeah. 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 It's still a shocking number. It is, and yeah, I think the cost of gas too, because last time that was like thirty. They are still around thirty percent, but they are slowly ticking up as well. The key for both Wamata for Metro Rail and for BRE is going to be the return of the federal government to yeah. the office. So I will also say that the seven thousand series is starting to come back slowly, oh, and so as we add more capacity, I mean, right now the having ridden it over the weekend. Um, the, the trains are crowded, but they're in trains. And that is a real dis dissuader for people who live for longer trains. It's a bad combination of words, crowded and frequent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they call it, they're crowded because they're busy. We were surprised um, Saturday afternoon coming back. It was almost standing. Really? Yeah. There was a lot going on. There was a lot going on in the district, but but so it just builds up in the stations, and then everybody gets on the car. I'm up there. I now take Amtrak to Metro Union Station. The trains are 42 years in that range. In Metro? No, in Metro. Because that's how I get to the city. But they're not. 
think if you look further out, you're, it's still smarter to drive for people even. So the 7,000 series cars coming back, that was a, that's a real positive move. Uh, that's been a long road for WMATA, the Metro Rail Safety Commission. So as, as those start to come back online right now, it's, a, it's basically a daily visual inspection for every part of the service. Uh, there's some technology that's going to be added to the system later this year that's going to make that more efficient. Than What's the timing on that? Yeah. Um, Do the Later this summer, and then hopefully good news also. How are we doing with the training people? Uh, they are they are working on that because that is another thing that's limiting their ability to provide service is having their their staff. So I would say they're highly motivated to do that first. Uh, new CEO and general manager Randy Clark coming from Cat Metro in Austin will start on July twenty. Also, a very good sign. But I, I will say their acting CEO was one of the first ones to ride the 7000 series when they came back online. And I think that is good from a public perception um, perspective. He's very visible. So, Silver Line, very visible. Yeah, do we have an idea what percentage of, the, of those 7000 vehicles back? Right now, it's, it's relatively small. They're coming, coming off as small. They come on eight at a time. Because that's and there's what they're on. Uh, okay. Seven hundred. Well, they have to come in groups of eight, I guess. Because I was going to say they could the train, 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 train kind of says come in groups of that. Also, just for the system. But you see, Andy doesn't have to really start on so long. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Couple of things. They're, they're getting close to an operational readiness date, and once Metro is able to set that date, then we'll have the timeline. So there's a few, I will say, outstanding issues that, that aren't in Metro's hands. Some of them we're trying to help them with. Um, I mean, they're still talking some time this year. I feel like we're getting close. And I will. Move on, uh, Virginia Breeze ridership. Um, we were up above pre pandemic levels. Um, ridership on all of our routes was 140% of what it was this time last year. Okay. So we're seeing that um, continue to do very well. Our Bristol run for our friends out in the Great Southwest continues to far exceed our expectations. I think they're over 200% of what we had anticipated in terms of monthly passengers. So. Virginia Breeze ridership is back. We've done a ton of media answer questions and stuff about that about the system and how well it's doing. Uh, so that's very good news as well. And it's a single trip daily, but back and forth. It is. It's one northbound, one southbound every day for each of the runs. Yeah, yeah. But but Jen, you put in other uh, buses on the street that anybody who wants to come to. That that is correct. So we have so that. That's a DRPT contracted service. So we monitor the ticket sales. And if we see the bus getting full, we work with our contractor to add a bus. So we've run as many as 11 buses in one direction to meet demand on a single day. That was pre pandemic um, in the ID1 quarter, but we have the flexibility to meet the demand. Um, now that we have two frequencies with the two runs in the ID1 quarter, we try to kind of push folks to the other route before we add. Um, buses cost down, but but yeah, we have the flexibility to meet the demand that's in front of us. That's pretty amazing. Well done on that. Uh, last thing I'll mention on the transit side, we are actively working on federal discretionary grants. We had a couple of big federal programs that we had applications to at the end of May. Uh, for the first time this year, DRPT submitted an application for bus and bus facilities. Uh, we we basically did that on behalf of three of the small urban systems, Charlottesville, Lynchburg, and Harrisonburg, uh, to buy 18 transit vehicles. And so that funding is awarded. The amount of state funds that have to go to support the purchase of those vehicles goes down considerably. So these are applications to the infrastructure bill? Yes. And then we also worked with Hampton Roads Transit, OmniRide, uh, Richmond, Blacksburg, and Williamsburg as they submitted their own discretionary grant applications uh, by that May 31st deadline. 
we're already looking at our capital needs assessment and projects that are in our pipeline so that we can start working on applications for the next cycle that will come out next spring. I was in Winchester uh, over the weekend, visited uh, the folks at uh, Wintran. Uh, they have a facility project that is ready to go, and we're going to work with them. They may actually submit the application on their behalf for next cycle of bus and bus facilities. So we are aggressively seeking to get that federal money back. Is that an electric bus? Um, so we're discussing with them. They, they were talking about they want to make sure that what they build is built for their future and can accommodate. Right now they run small vehicle body on chassis, but they're looking at making sure the facility can accommodate uh, a full size transit bus. Yeah, like, it's doing well. I don't have one. I'll have the numbers, but that, that has something to do with Across the board. On the rail side, um, our staff, Emily and her team, and BPRA, we hosted the Federal Railroad Administration last, uh, last week. Looks like a, a couple weeks ago uh, for a meeting. They did, gave them a site tour of some of the Richmond area projects, passenger and freight rail. Uh, we are also working on the rail side to make sure that we compete for the Federal Railroad Administration discretionary grants. We're expecting some notice of funding opportunities coming out for like the rail crossing elimination program later this month and uh, Emily and her team are working on uh, the rail plan and the rail policies which we will brief you on this month in subcommittee. Mentioned the um, RIA projects already. On the BPRA side, I will, since I'm talking about all the federal discretionary money, we um, we did get word um, since we last met that we were awarded, BPRA was awarded six and a half million dollars in Chrissy funds for ADA approved improvements to the Ettrick station. In Chesterfield County, and then um, there was a joint application, North Carolina Amtrak and BPRA, for Chrissy funds for the Richmond to Raleigh corridor, and that received an award of 58 million. So, uh, working very hard to bring those federal dollars back to the taxpayers. So, that is my report, good news report for this month. Uh, so, that is to get us to 30% um, design for the Richmond to Raleigh. That is that includes the S line, which is part of the Transforming Rail Virginia arrangement with CSX. There is parts of that corridor abandoned, parts of that built by rail, and there's some challenges in that corridor. So I think there were some rather aggressive dates uh, thrown out by North Carolina for Richmond to Raleigh service. That, what <laughs> would be aggressive dates? Oh, it's like, it's like four or five years from that. Well, I, I, I can't imagine that it couldn't be done. I just this is an existing road that I understand there have been some intrusions on it, but it's relatively at grade. The alignments are pretty simple. Uh, you know, I don't know why we couldn't do this in four or five years. I think setting an inspirational <laughs> target that's pretty aggressive would be the thing to do with this. If, if ever the infrastructure was in place to be brought up to date, this is this is a classic case of I don't want to say dust it off. It's a bit more than that. But a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, it is, but, it is. but I'm telling you, getting you know, getting that alignment, if you're doing it from scratch, you get hit a lot. It of it, but it's there. You know, you're going to buy it even these So this funding will help get to it. It's heading down that path, but right now there's no engine. What's the time frame for getting to 30%? Oh, that's right. I have to get back to you. Could you do it? Because that's, that's the leading step that's going to help happen no. sooner. Jen, this makes me um, think about the fact that when we get to smart scale, the board has the ability to put two into the mix. And, you know, where we've already got federal money identified, I guess it's just a question sort of to put out there because it's not to the next spring that we actually will be in that moment. Uh, is it, do we have to do it by the, by the end of this year? Applications or applications will be due back in August. So I guess start seeing things. So we need to like, if we're going to add something, it needs to happen in the fall. And I guess, you know, some of these things make me think about maybe we ought to be looking not only at road, but at you know, is there a strategic place that, that an infusion of state money might help accelerate a project? 
um, just just a wonder. I, I, I wanted to ask about Long Bridge. Have we have we put in for Chrissy or any of these other? What's our, our plan relative to I? So there there has been an IIJ okay. as well. There was for for the large projects. There was a combined application that included Mega and there's like three big grant applications. Uh, grant programs that were done together. Gotcha. So it went into the same kind of response with 64 gap and route one multi modal, but there were requirements for about these versus. Okay, so we're hearing about route one multi modal today, and the 64 gap was the other one, but we, but not about one. So it, you know, I guess the confusion I have is I'm not sure what, where we're, what we're asking. And how we're prioritizing. Yeah, so I would just be interested if there's any way to get us just sort of, you know, here's what jurisdictions put in, here's what the department put in. Um, the summer would be really helpful. So that, so that we perfect. just know, you know, and all of it's a crapshoot. I think we all understand that. So, so BPRA did at their last, at their main board meeting, approve the financial plan for the program project. That's all, that all falls under BPRA. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is also. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so North Carolina is the lead on this. We're obviously the is a partner, but they're they're um, they did primarily did the need work with Fort all the way up to Richmond. So they said the timeline. They think they can do four or five years. They got a lot of all stuff. They've got a lot of work to do. Five years, they do not have the up to three years. But I guess the EIS is complete enough to date at this point. The EIS is complete. Has it been updated on it? So there, there may have to be some um, reevaluation as a result of the three percent engineering. So yeah, it's because it, it it's been out there for a while, and and you know when we did DCRPA, we did. 30 percent, 29 percent design along with the DC RBA NEPA. Um, with the North Carolina study, the, the, um, the S line study, the NEPA was only much 10 percent. So there are going to be some, some changes, and that is something that, that can, it is unpredictable about the timeline. But there are some changes. And also, property acquisition, it does a lot of that. I think over time we'd like to learn more about this because it would be like other things that we can implement in the foreseeable future. Getting service to Lolly, good fortune to the, the invitation to stop the ride to the Amtrak train recently in the head end. And there's a good deal of excitement on the part of the train crews about getting that service to Lolly. I mean, it's it's yeah, yeah, it's powerful. So you can feel the excitement on the part of the Amtrak people having this new link, new rail. Fifty-three or fifty-eight million that we have to be able to utilize. We have a feel for what North Carolina has in their program, sort of, or this, is, or is this a combined amount? Fifty-eight million was the federal. The federal, okay. So, do we have an idea what North Carolina, what we're looking at, you know, what North Carolina is sort of putting up to be able to meet it, state line? Yeah, I'll, I, I will get you the numbers. They're, they're know that they're contributing. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is a lot of uh, a lot of good news, a lot of things going on. Something I'm hearing more and more about, which is not good news, is, is that Amtrak service is not dependable. And any form of transportation is going to be utilized, and people are going to make a decision to use it, it has to be reasonably dependable. Not 100%, but, but, but um, particularly within the last several months, Amtrak long distance trains running through Virginia have been consistently one, two, three, five and a half miles late. That is not going to work. So I'd like to see a report on that at some future time to make a discussion of this committee. What is the long time performance? The long time, I don't mean to defend it, but, but you know, within 15 to 20 minutes or something, you can put it in the middle. Because it is 
not good. And people are starting to tell me, but why do I want to ride Amtrak when I don't know what time I'm going to get there? <laughs> Where you get to a primitive station, just sit in there for five hours quick. That looks like I just caught you in New York. And the line went down to New Jersey. No idea. People were standing at the track waiting for the train for like a week. Especially stations that are not person. No information coming in. No information about cancellation. <laughs> They're flying next time. This is a really interesting conversation. What where's our line versus EPRA in this whole in this? I mean, we certainly can express our concerns, sure. but are we respond where's the line? It is certainly the EPRA board. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's part of their discussions. They you know, they get a report from the executive director a month that has that kind of information in it about ridership and on performance. I think it's their day to day responsibility. I, I think it's completely valid for this board as as funding flows through Commonwealth Transportation Fund, the Commonwealth Rail Fund to BPRA to ask questions. Yeah. It's complex. Well, and maybe what we want is the whatever their on time performance data sheet is, goes in our folders yep. at the desk. That, that would be, that, you know, doesn't that, that, that like a really that. Easy, 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 just as an FYI. You can make that more. All right, so we have two presentations on the agenda for you today, and there is another committee that does meet at 10 o'clock, so we have a Time frame. We're going to start with um, we're wrapping up a study that was mandated by the General Assembly, House Joint Resolution 542. This is the Transit Equity and Modernization Study. You've seen a you briefing on this late last year. Um, we finished up the interim report. The um, our final report is due uh, in August. So we're wrapping up. Turn it over to Grant. Let him walk you through uh, the update on this program. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, as Jen mentioned, uh, this will be the final briefing on the House Joint Resolution 542 Virginia Transit Equity and Modernization Study. Uh, we are very happy that this is coming uh, together. Uh, um, we spent uh, a year on this study. Um, our entire transit team has been involved in the development of the study. Uh, every transit agency in Virginia has been engaged, a number of stakeholders. Um, it has been a pretty giant effort. So we're really happy uh, that it's finally coming to a close. Um, today, um, uh, I'm going to, uh, I guess, quickly uh, just go over uh, study background. As Jim mentioned, uh, in September, I briefed the subcommittee as we were just getting started on the project. Um, I also presented to the full board, I think, in December. Um, so it's been a while, so I'll just start uh, with a refresher on House Joint Resolution 542, uh, which is the legislation that created the study. Um, as some of you uh, may recall, that we had a number of key study activities planned throughout the study development process. Uh, so I'll provide an overview of those activities as well. Um, Jen mentioned that we submitted the uh, interim study report in December to the General Assembly, so I'll uh, provide an overview of that. I'll also provide uh, a summary of the study action plan, which we actually just wrapped up earlier this month. And I'll close out with some next steps as we look to uh, close out the study. Slide. So, uh, so in 2021, the General Assembly passed House Joint Resolution 542, uh, which required BRTT to complete a needs assessment that focuses on the equitable delivery of transit services and the modernization of transit in Congress. Um, also, HA 542 required uh, DRPT to uh, place an emphasis on transit services and engagement opportunities for underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, and in addition to the terms equity and modernization, the resolution requires DRPT to explore a variety of topics. Those topics are listed on the screen here in this graphic. They include transit accessibility, the adequacy of transit infrastructure, transit electrification, emerging technologies in transit, transit safety, and system engagement. 
So this is like kind of the uh, high level timeline of what we've accomplished to date. I'll get into some more details on the next slide. Uh, but we started this, uh, this study uh, last July um, and spent the first couple months um, collecting as much data as we could from our transit agencies, our statewide data sets, whatever we could get our hands on, we wanted to take a look at it. Uh, then we spent fall and the early portion of the winter doing our baseline conditions and needs assessment. Um, that concluded with our submission of the interim study report to the General Assembly in December. And then we've been uh, working very hard since January on developing an action plan to address the needs uh, that were defined in that baseline conditions and needs assessment. Um, and as Jen mentioned, uh, the final study report is going to the General Assembly in August. So uh, in terms of the key study activities, um, on the left I've li listed uh, all the study deliverables that have been completed to date. I mentioned the data collection already. Uh, we did uh, complete two transit agency surveys. Uh, every transit agency did uh, respond to uh, the first survey, um, which, which was great. Um, we held a series of rider focus groups. This was our opportunity to talk directly to uh, transit riders uh, and hear from them what their experiences are uh, and if they had any concerns. Um, I mentioned the baseline conditions assessment. This, uh, this te the tech memo that was created for baseline conditions is a 250 page document. It is very comprehensive very technical um, and it is available on our website um, if you're interested in taking a look. Um, the interim study report again was submitted in uh, December and I uh, just mentioned the action plan. Here, here in the second column we have our different uh, engagement activities that we've completed. Uh, we created a transit equity and modernization committee or a TEMC. Uh, this was a group of 12 transit agency CEOs that kind of act as an advisory board uh, or committee rather uh, throughout the development of the study. Um, so we had uh, a recurring check-ins with that group. Uh, we also developed technical working groups or TWGs for each of those topic areas that were called out in the legislation. Um, those TWGs included uh, transit agency staff, um, DRPT staff, uh, as well as stakeholders and other industry partners. Um, and like the TEMCs, we met periodically throughout the uh, study uh, development process. We held a number of stakeholder meetings as well. Um, there was a, a large group of interest groups um, that, uh, that helped create House Joint Resolution 542. So we had recurring check-ins with that group. But as you can imagine, that group did grow over time as more and more uh, um, uh, organizations became interested in the study. We held dozens of agency briefings throughout the Commonwealth, uh, talking to every single MPO um, in the Commonwealth. We did some presentations for different transit agencies. We presented at conferences. We really tried to get the word out there that we were doing this study and solicit feedback. Uh, we conducted a Share Your Transit Story campaign. Um, this was to solicit testimonials from transit riders as to what their experiences are riding transit. Um, and then a couple months ago, we did a virtual forum, which was a big uh, public uh, uh, webinar, essentially, to raise awareness of the study and solicit any final feedback. Uh, and then the last uh, deliverable here on the right is the final study. So uh, just diving in uh, to the interim study report, um, uh, this is just a high level overview uh, of the interim study report. I'm going to do the same for the action plan. Uh, again, uh, all this information is on our study website. Um, I think I have a link in a couple slides here, but it's batransitmodernization.com. Um, these these first couple bull, uh, bullets were uh, were some of the major takeaways from that interim study report, and they're uh, interrelated. Uh, basic transit infrastructure, which we define as shelters, benches, and lighting, so bus stop infrastructure uh, is in, insufficient. We also found that many bus stops uh, in the Commonwealth are poorly placed and not well connected to the sidewalk network. Um, we have over 15,000 bus stops in Virginia. Um, so trying to analyze 15,000 bus stops was not an easy task. Um, DRPT staff actually, we, we worked with our consultants to uh, gain access to a tool where we were able to do a virtual assessment of bus stops. Um, and so DRPT staff looked at just shy of 700 bus stops in the Commonwealth. And it was a statistically valid sample across the Commonwealth to see what the condition was. Uh, we want to look at ADA accessibility. 
what uh, what features were at the bus stop? Was there shelter? Was there lighting? Just we wanted to understand what the conditions were at the bus stops. Um, so that was a really good exercise and taught us uh, taught us a lot. Um, moving down this list, uh, the availability of transit in Virginia is actually pretty high, um, but there are of course some gaps. Uh, the good news is that based on our analysis, uh, the gaps were not disproportionately located in areas with vulnerable communities. Um, so, uh, so we thought that, that was a, a positive. Um, there is increasing interest among our transit agencies in piloting zero fare services to overcome the barriers to transit accessibility. I think our trip program has certainly raised awareness of, of uh, zero fare services and the benefits. Um, so there's increasing popularity there. Um, and also more and better data is needed to uh, make informed decisions. This was, this was a recurring theme throughout the study development process was that we just needed better data and our transit agencies struggled to get good data at the local level. So that kind of trickled up to us as well. So we need, we, we certainly need to do something uh, to get better data. So yeah, um, the big one is honestly ridership. Every transit agency in Virginia collects ridership. Different methods for collecting ridership. Some use fare box uh, technology. Um, some use automa uh, automated passenger counters. Some use pen and paper, to be honest. And there's no consistency on the technologies that they're using to collect the ridership data or really how it needs to be formatted to submit it to us. Um, and so we felt like there were some, some big opportunities there. But then also data on the conditions of their assets and their vehicles. And, um, you know, counting their, their vehicle miles and their vehicle hours. And it's just really across the board, I think, we need to do a better job of collecting and sharing uh, data. Okay. That very, usually it's easy to provide data if you have a pen. You orchestrated the pen, like that makes it easier for every jurisdiction to do exactly. Yes, um, so we did. We included in our, our guidance document that we provide to all of our transit agencies a basic template of what they need to be uh, submitting to us in terms of ridership hours and miles. I think what we learned through this process was that we, we might need to go a little bit further and even maybe do some hands-on training with them. And there are certain agencies that really just struggle to uh, uh, to get data and submit it to us. We probably need to do some some one-on-one -on -one trainings and walk them through the template. Kind of and I think that the other piece of that is there are some things that really jumped out to us as opportunities where we can come in and help with procurement of technology and you know and best practices and how do we relay that to the transit agencies. And so where we're seeing those things, we're going ahead, we're not waiting for this to be finished. We're jumping into it saying, what can we do? I know uh, Deputy Secretary DC is back there. We've talked about some of the challenges we've faced in procuring technology and working with other state agencies. That are involved in that process. She's uh, committed to helping us uh, unravel some of the red tape at the state level so that we can do more of that to make it easier for transit agencies to, to purchase things like automated passenger counters. And things for state. But this is critical for data driven system that's that related. So. Yeah. Um, just a quick question Did you collect um, separated information on paratransit as opposed to regular? So we already do that. Do. Um, agencies have to submit um, ridership hours and miles to DRPT on a monthly basis by service type. Okay. So that, that's how we're able to look at Metro's uh, ridership. We also get fair transit ridership for every transit agency. So yes, we do. In the more urban places, um, I worked on bus stops when I was on the Metro. So bus stops are the responsibility of the jurisdictions to fund and yet they're so critical and the trade-off between what we were spending on paratransit if we could improve our bus stops people move they they, they would prefer to take the regular buses it's more dependable it you know gets caught up less in people's drama so it was a there was a moment or two of sort of we had to pay for both but what we saw was once we improved those bus stops the cost of peer transit dropped pretty dramatically. And so, you know, that's another, 
I can't emphasize how important the bus stop and the sidewalk. The sidewalk is important for people with disabilities. And the and the bus stops is something we we've, we've talked about before. before and the fun bus stop. One of the things that that we really heard out of this was particularly bus stops on state right of way were a challenge. We would see that we would fund bus stops and they would take a long time to get implemented. So we started. Trying not to people. Um, we, we actually, our engineer came from BDOT, and we, when he came over, I was like, "Look, I need you to figure out why this is so hard because it shouldn't be." And he was a resident engineer, and he understood the land use permit. He has dug into it and mapped out the process, and has said, "This is why we can't get a bus stop built because there's all these different pieces, and none of it is geared to making this easy for anybody." And so we're actively working. BDOT has been a great partner. Uh, we're working with them to figure out how we can make those improvements more quickly um, because it does have such an impact on our ridership and on accessibility. And those are things that we always knew there was something going on, but this study has put a brighter light on what things are standing in our, like that we control that stand right. in our own way. And so I, I think that's, that's stuff again, we have, we're not waiting until the action plan, we're jumping on that now. Same thing in electrification. Does DRPT have any funding program like they do within VDOT, uh, comes from the Fed, i.e. the TAP program, Transportation Alternatives Program? No, unfortunately we don't. Now transit activities like bus stop improvements and sidewalk uh, connections to bus stops are eligible under the TAP program. Right. So, um, but DRPT, no, we don't have specific. Andy, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, so again, um, uh, there's a lot of information posted on our website. Uh, and the, the link to the website uh, is uh, on the screen here. Uh, if you're not interested in, in looking through a large PDF document, we also develop an interactive story map, uh, which is a little bit easier to I think digest for some folks, and it includes some. Uh, some interactive maps so you can actually see some of the analyses that we performed, uh, survey results, and then things of that nature. So, uh, moving on to the action plan. Um, again, we wrapped this up earlier this month. Um, and similar to the uh, interim study report, I'll just touch on some of the highlights. Um, but before I get into these, I did want to just quickly mention that the recommendations uh, in the action plan. The vast, the vast majority of them are uh, for DRPT. It's DRPT's responsibility to act on them. There are a handful of actions uh, that are specific to NPOs, uh, localities, and transit agencies, uh, but DRPT will likely uh, assume the responsibility for most of these. Um, so just touching on some of the highlights, um, develop technical guidance on policy uh, or policy on bus stop design elements and installation. Jen already kind of mentioned that We've already uh, taken a stab at mapping out the process for installing uh, a bus stop or a bus shelter rather on state-owned right-of-way. Um, our engineering manager uh, mapped it out for us. And it, it's a seven-page document of how to navigate the permitting process and get through all the approvals. It's not just VDOT, it's actually the Department of General Services also has to be involved. So there's a lot of back and forth and really there's it's, it's not shocking after seeing you know the process on paper that um, the transit agencies struggle with this. Um, so we definitely need to do something there to help streamline that process and clean it up a little bit. Um, we also uh, uh, felt that we needed to develop some guidance and best best practices on streamlining stakeholder coordination and prioritizing improvements around bus stops. Um, there's a lot of coordination uh, with localities um, and the NPOs on. Um, Bus stop improvements, so uh, we felt that we needed to do something there. Um, update merit capital scoring uh, to incentivize improvements to bus stop infrastructure. Uh, as you all know, we have a uh, prioritization process that uh, is uh, baked into CTB policy uh, for all transit capital projects. Um, bus stops do okay, but not great in our current uh, um, uh, prioritization uh, process and methodology. Um, and we're actually already working with TISDAC to uh, make some recommendations to the board for um, incentivizing more bus stop infrastructure in that program. Mm -hmm. 
uh, develop technical guidance or industry best practices for monitoring and reporting <coughs> infrastructure performance and condition. I mentioned that transit agencies struggle with data on uh, on their infrastructure's performance, so we want to develop some technical guidance here to help them with that. Uh, develop qualitative and quantitative metrics to measure reliable and effective transit service that promotes access to opportunity. Um, here we we want to do a, a better job of the state level measuring our progress to transit accessibility. And there are a number of ways that you can measure transit accessibility. Um, and so we want to basically develop us uh, a methodology that we can then benchmark and, and look to uh, basically measure ourselves against as we move forward to see if we're making progress there. And the last one here, um, updating and enhanced ERPD's uh, transit strategic plan guidelines to provide uh, strategies for enhanced public engagement. Uh, we're actually already working on this one with TISDAC as well. Um, we, we heard from uh, a lot of the riders that we talked to that there aren't great uh, opportunities for transit riders to be a part of the decision making process uh, with their local transit agencies. Um, and so we wanted to do a better job of that through this transit strategic plan guidelines uh, require our transit agencies to do a better job in their outreach efforts uh, as they're developing their plans and it's also as they're making decisions. <laughs> So and this may exist under a different umbrella. Are there any efforts being made to collectivize procurement and acquisition of transit equipment? And I know that in other instances we help to create standard-based contracts, but we've seen these organizations all buying the same things and doing the same things and building the same. Things. What can we do to kind of consolidate, hopefully improve their price performance, and maybe create some standards within the industry that don't exist today? So we've done that with vehicles. Mm -hmm. We've done with outbound cars for a year. <laughs> and I'll joke them about that. Um, we are looking at some other opportunities, technology, shelters. There's there's other things that we can put on a state contract that would make it easier. Should that be listed on here then? Because I think it's an important. It, it, it's, it's a facilitator. Yeah. It might sure. actually be on this next slide. Oh. Uh, Yes, it's the third ball of town guidance for establishing and negotiating transit technology. Yes. Um, and you're right. technology or equipment? Um, I mean, uh, it, it depends how you define equipment. I'm broad that scope. Uh, okay. Real important. Speed up the game for I think some of our biggest challenges in doing that have been within state government, and I think we have the opportunity to address some of those things. You guys can find your who better. That's a huge leverage. Yeah. So, so here's the plan, and here's how you buy it. Here's what's going to cost. We, we have, we've done that with some of the, the yeah, we did the pilot, <coughs> we did the contract. We, we procured um, technology to retrofit buses from the yeah. we, we did that under a state contract. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we've done some of that and want to do more. This has given us an avenue to talk to the transit agencies about what mm -hmm. what makes the most sense for them for us to do it. The RPT has no real control over local transit. Correct. It's a budget budget. It's correct. A correct. But the city council are mm -hmm. cities are their own transit authority. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a stand except from the bus. We can get the information. They they all report ridership. The quality of the data and the way that the data is collected varies across the transportation. So we get the data. If you don't have the data, they don't get Ms. Hines point, they don't get funding. It, it's how it's collected and how good the data is and how useful the data is. And that's where if we, Professor Kathowitz's point, if we put a state contract out there that provided some specific tools, that incentivizes them to easily go procure that tool and then there's consistency across the board. It's a big time saver, potentially plus there. Okay, can we modify that? Uh, bullet number three to say transit technology and equipment contracts. And I did want to just clarify. So when we say transit technology, we also mean the associated hardware 
with that file. I wouldn't know that. So we, if we, if we can clear that up and just put and it's sure. meant for be inclusive of transit equipment. We can see that. Absolutely. I know you're trying to finish up, but because uh, we do want to get, don't want to get my, but um, my question is: Did is there anything that you learned about reaching underserved or less heard voices here that um, that we should know as we think about other processes um, that CTB interacts? You know, what you learned. So, so the big lesson learned uh, for engagement with uh, underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, so we did we did this transit agency survey at the very beginning of the process, and we asked every transit agency, did they have a rider advisory group um, to advise their board of directors? Um, less than a third of transit agencies have a group like that. Um, and that's, I don't want to say it's industry standard, but we, we kind of felt like transit agencies probably should have some committee, some sort of advisory committee or grassroots organization or whatever it is to advise the board on what's happening, um, you know, on the buses and what the needs are of the passengers. And so that is one of our uh, recommendations uh, in this study is to promote and encourage, uh, especially uh, the second last bullet point here. The creation of rider advisory councils and committees with local, within the local transit. I know we want to move on. on this, but could we mandate that as part of our grant programs so that if you're going to be a recipient of our grants, that there be a advisory panel? I'm going to offer an alternative because I think the problem with um, adv rider advisory groups, and again, I've worked with them both at the local level and at the Pomada level, is that the only the people who have the time right. to go and and so mm -hmm. you don't really get a cross section of your riders. Mm -hmm. I would rather see us mandate a, a once a year period where there's a survey on the process that, would be great. that people can just take and 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 then For Title Six they actually should be doing right and so they should put a few more questions in there to make sure that we're actually getting feedback on the service um, from a broader. I mean, I yeah. I mean, still yeah. advisory committees become. They don't mean this so. in a negative way, but they they uh, collect around an issue, right. and so they work the issue, and they don't have the whole picture. It's just the nature of the piece. My, my suggestion for the I, I, I think it's really important to have the board in the decision making process. The more public voice. Survey. Yeah, that captures everybody. Yeah. Uh, that we did focus groups as part of the study, and I it, they were all virtual, but the technology that was used allowed us to sit behind a one way mirror and watch the focus group and feed questions to the moderator. And to me, I mean, we sat in we sat in more of that. I mean, hours of this interaction and the, hearing the questions from the folks that ride the service. It was completely different. And they were they were curated groups around it. They were there was a paratransit. There was you know, folks that ride regularly. There's folks that choose not to ride regularly. And it was a it was a different discussion. That was a very valuable tool to me in this study. And something that you, you didn't get that group thing. They were from different, they they weren't people that had told they each each other for a moment. Yeah. yeah. And they they left. And that's I think that was also very valuable. So think about that as part of what you require in the strategic right. plan. Yes. Like it's like that's exactly. where they have to do something like that where you guys can watch right. as they have played. I, I just think we did have some of that. Yeah. Good. Policy Real thing. quickly, apart, apart benches and shelters, is there any initiative to have track for something? I know from my perspective in Norfolk, uh, every bus stop you have a pile of trash and no trash receptacles. The city. If, if you don't see a bench, you see a shopping cart. If you see a bench, but you know, I think trash receptacles uh, to be part of that. If it is, maybe or that. Yeah, it's eligible under our capital program. Transit agencies can apply for those as well. You could have the CRPT could put out a you know this many riders. This is what you should have. Best this best practices, best practices yeah. and the trash can should be. Yeah, what we're talking about here. Serious conversation about equity and 
is this right on point with the misconception of these So, and one last comment on, on the <laughs> equity. I'm sorry, one last comment. Uh, the, the analysis of the benefits of zero fare in looking at this study, its impact, the benefits it provides us, is where does that think it would have, have to be one of the most significant factors? So, that just looking at what our transfer TPB is planning and, and Washington region, zero fare is a big part of that. Where are we in helping transit agencies address, consider, and perhaps pursue zero fare based models? So that is really, that is really the uh, focus of the TRIP program right now, the Transit Ridership Incentive Program. We funded six, seven agencies to pilot zero fare. And part of the legislation that established that program requires us to evaluate, they're, they're all performance based projects. So we're consistently evaluating how these projects go and we have reports in the general assembly. Should that be in this one? Uh, that's already required by code. So, so it's, it's, already it, there. it's already there. And I, but I can tell you that the systems that have gone zero fare, their ridership, I mean, Richmond, Alexandria, uh, Winchester, it's been zero fare. Uh, their ridership is up. I mean, there is. There is definitely a, a pattern that is coming together very quickly. And you're looking at the the delta in terms of costs because there's the cost associated with the, yeah. uh, that fare box recovery, which is minor. I mean, the the amount of money it's bringing in revenue wise is generally minor. We actually had a system that was a small rural system that was spending more money or about as much money as it took to collect the fares. And what they were gathering picked up out in um, out in Southwest Virginia. We thought they were going to apply for trip, and they just said, "Stop. We don't need to. We're just going to take the fares off." Interesting. So I, I think you can't underestimate how much money is spent on the technology and the process and the management of collecting fares that goes into that equation. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Good presentation. This just shows the action plan summary. It's available on our website. You can take that slide. Um, so I mentioned the draft. The draft action plan was available for public comment uh, last month, um, and we're submitting the final study report to the General Assembly in August. So. Um, Thank you. Sorry, it takes so long. I feel like last week we had an hour and a half. Well, well, yeah. We're only going to have two committee meetings, and it's three hours. There's no reason in both committee meetings to have an hour and a half. So, so the, the next um, next presentation, we have Mike Todd. He's going to talk about kind of cost analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just called there and said, we're all going to be late. I'm going to text <laughs> Angel right now and let her know that oh, we're running late. And uh, Mike, take it away. I'm trying to do that. Version, which this <laughs> kind of set up for already. Um, so I just wanted, we've been doing something in the background, we've been working to update our benefit cost analysis model, which we use kind of um, for a lot of different things at, at the RPT and the Red Division. Um, and if you could jump to the next slide for me. Uh, so first, I'm just going to start with kind of the purpose of the model. Um, some of you may remember we had a previous program called the Rail Enhancement Program, and by code, a benefit cost analysis was required to administer that program. And so this benefit cost analysis model was developed for that program, you know, kind of to meet the code requirements. Um, since then, we've, we've updated it many times. Um, the ARIA program is no longer um, current due to the 2020 uh, legislation. Uh, but so now we've incorporated the benefit cost analysis as part of our scoring criteria for the new freight program. So using it in the scoring for the freight program is the, the only place that the model is required for use. However, we also incorporate it into our planning process that we use it for the state rail plan to kind of um, espouse the benefits of rail for the state as a whole and kind of for some of our you know, future potential stuff, you know, project scenarios. Uh, we also use it with some of the RA applications that you've seen, the rail industrial access applications that you've seen month to month at uh, the workshops. Um, and then, of course, we just kind of do some internal, you know, project prioritization. And we also use it, and this is one of the key things, for our federal applications. So when we submit a, a rail application to the FRA, it's compliant with their, you know, benefit cost analysis requirements, and so we use that as well. Um, the Kind of the primary assumption here that I'll go over is just that 
we assume that consumers are driving goods. So it's not the existence of the rail line that makes goods move. It's that consumers are demanding those goods and they happen to move over the rail line or over um, the highway network. Um, so the assumption is that consumers are driving the demand. And kind of in the second point of that is in the absence of the rail network, those goods would need to continue to move and the most likely comparative option is the other surface transportation mode, which is trucks on the highway. So those are kind of the two main model assumptions, and that's how it's, it's set up. And essentially what it basically just does is monetize the benefits of the weight that you're moving over the rail network. If the rail network wasn't there, you take that same weight and you put it onto the roadway network, and you'd have to drive it on trucks for the same distance it's going to take on the rail network. And uh, the rail network, you know, is is by ton more efficient than you know moving goods by truck, um, and uh, has less emissions uh, and doesn't wear down the highway pavement. Um, and so there's all these costs that we can kind of accrue to show the benefit of moving goods over the highway network. Um, so that's kind of the main driver and main assumption that the model uses. A question about the metrics associated with this. So. This is an observation I've had in recent times that one of the significant impacts of truck traffic, which we know is growing very rapidly in the roads, is the time that it costs me. And I would say, coming down here yesterday, most of the, and I say this anecdotally, everybody's experiencing this. That's a significant factor when it comes to delay in our traffic model, showing the delay that's created by truck traffic versus rail traffic. I'm not delayed by rail traffic in general. Is that a factor that we can use? It is, it's one of the, it is one of the. Yes, factors. definitely. Value of time for people in their cars is. So that's one of the things we look at. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that should be, unfortunately, going for Yeah, and actually we have it locality specific. So, um, you know, we can take into account the median income in, say, Northern Virginia, which is higher in, than in some other areas of Virginia, and also there's more congestion in that area. So all of that factors in. Yeah. So the next uh, part of the presentation was just to go over the inputs. And I know that this is kind of hard to read from a presentation perspective, but what I wanted to do here is these are literally screenshots of the model itself. And so I wanted to use the screenshots kind of for two purposes. One, to show that you, we have complete transparency with this model. It is posted on our website. We have the data definitions and the user manual on our website. It is completely 100% publicly available, including the background calculation. So anyone and everyone can take a look at it. Um, and also to kind of show you that we um, included in the model is breaking down those definitions so it's as easy as possible for people to use. So when you, if you downloaded the spreadsheet of the model, you would see these kind of sections. It would have that kind of yellowish area where you as the user are putting in the data and then it gives you the definition over there on the right of what am I actually putting in this box. And so it kind of walks you through it as we use it. Um, I'll skip through these kind of really quickly in the interest of time, but essentially first we look at the timeline of the project, when are we spending the funds. Second, we look at the, um, uh, you can move to the next slide, Andy, thanks, the uh, location, and this is specific to the localities in Virginia, so you can choose one corridor um, uh, that might pair well with the rail network that you're talking about, or you can choose all of them and get a state average. Um, next slide. You have a whole lot of metrics about the rail trip itself. You know, uh, what's the current demand? What will be the future demand after the project? You know, what's the weight? Uh, what's, uh, you know, what are the, the average travel times? Things like that. So the kind of a robust uh, characteristic set of the, the rail trip. And then next slide, we compare that to the characteristics of the truck trip. So, you know, again, what's the, the length of the trip and the distance of the time? The way that we've set this model up is we have statewide averages um, that are based on you know, the data that we've collected. So you can just use the, as a default the statewide average, or if you are shipping a material, say coal, for example, which is heavier than a normal shipment, and you know exactly how much each of your rail cars weighs, you can put in that metric and, and update it specifically for that project. Um, so you, it's, it's, very, it's variable on how you can use it and, and how specific you need each project. So then uh, we have to put in the cost as well. We can we break those down over different categories. And also, I kind of put in some dummy numbers here just to kind of highlight that it does take into account the net present value of uh, you know, your spending. 
So the yellow highlight is essentially when does the project start? And then the green is when does the project conclude, i.e. when do we start calculating the benefits? Um, and so, you know, you may have previous fiscal years funding the project, but then the benefits don't start until later and, and all the model takes all that into account. Next slide. So then kind of one of the biggest drivers, as you can imagine, is the increase in demand. And so we take a look at, you know, uh, year one after the project's been implemented, what is the uh, new rail car throughput? What is the new rail car demand? Um, and we can actually, I think it's like 40 years we can calculate within this model. Most, um, most projects give us somewhere between 10 and 15 years, depending on just kind of the, the impact that they expect. Uh, next slide. So then we, uh, when you compare the, the impacts to, uh, or excuse me, when you compare the benefits to the cost, uh, it essentially gives you, uh, it breaks down the um, benefits by category. So it has a congestion reduction benefit, which is what we were kind of talking about uh, previously, that basically the users on the highway, how much will they benefit from those trucks being taken off the road? We have environmental impacts, both the shift from truck to rail, and also a distance reduction. So if the project uh, reduces the distance of the trip, we can calculate the environmental benefits that way. We have a shipping cost reduction, which goes directly to the Virginia businesses and Virginia shippers. Um, we have pavement maintenance savings and then also accident reduction. So pavement maintenance and accident reduction are, again, that, that paradigm of if you remove trucks, you have less accidents and you have um, less pavement maintenance per mile or per ton mile. And then Comparing, you know, all those benefits to the cost we get, we kind of break down the benefit cost ratio in four different ways. This is the uh, compliance with the federal requirements. So they look at a 3% inflation, a 7% inflation, and then we also break it down by, is it just the state funding and, and the total funding for the project, which would include the private match that goes along with it. And so we can see very clearly, you know, does this, uh, does the benefits exceed the cost and in what ways? Um, so this has to be greater than one. In, in order for you to get a successful application, it has to have, yeah, a greater than one. Um, and so the real reason I wanted to bring this to you <laughs> is actually, so we've been chasing something at DRBT for many years now, and it's been elusive and it's been hard to kind of define. And one of it is the reliability measure for the freight rail. So we have, I think, on the highway side, using things like smart scale and some of the data measures that we have, we've gotten closer to getting a very, very good reliability metric for the highway network, but it's been elusive for the freight rail network. And we've finally been able to add two measures to kind of get to reliability on the freight rail network. One is inventory carrying costs, which essentially takes a look at, you know, how much does it cost the company to, um, you know, hold and store uh, goods while they're, you know, waiting basically to get to market. Versus it just the time protocol use the trucking industry. So how do you gather that information? What does the data say? So we have an average for the state of, of Virginia um, that's in that's in the model, but also the user can tell us if they have a specific metric that they, you know, the, you know, specific value of their goods that cost for inventory. Um, and then the other reliability is literally reliability, and so it's basically, um, you know, uh, how does this project improve the variability in the travel time? So it's not about reducing the travel time. It's about um, focusing it around the time that you expect the trip to what actually happen. And so let's say if it's, it takes, an, I know this is a ridiculous example, but if it takes an hour for the trip, sometimes it might take an hour and a half, sometimes it may take 30 minutes. What we're trying to do is get it down to being as close to one hour as possible on every single trip um, that they take. So Mr. Smoot's earlier comments, this is perhaps some of the reasons we have Amtrak trains being completed that focus on that reliability. It shouldn't mean that nothing facetious. I mean, that's part of the contention that we face here. Is that freight primary problem with the rail Amtrak? Yeah. Getting things there on time is what freight their bottom line. So these, that, that was kind of a big update that I think was really valuable and really important in this, in this latest uh, update. There were a couple of other functionality updates, you know, sensitivity analysis, which is great for the user to kind of test things out. 
Um, next slide. Uh, and then also, this is a big one for me personally, some of the things that you see in the rail industrial access applications when we present them to the full board, I have to literally go into the model, break it apart, and manually calculate some of those benefits, which right for user error also takes me a lot of time. And so we built into the model that it will automatically calculate those things and just sit it out for us. And now, you know, less user error and a lot less time than I would spend making those calculations. Um, and so those are things like the emission reductions and uh, you know, things that we kind of put up in the slides. Yeah. Is is there any uh, study where the break even is? I mean, I'm in, in transportation and I'm making decisions on my customers moving it by truck or rail, and there's a determination factor and, and cost of money. So that's all they care about. It's like with the supply chain challenges we face today. Is if you make a decision to go by rail and it takes two days longer to get there than by truck. Uh, when it's my decision, my, my decision is going to be by truck. So where is the incentive? And where is the break even? How far does the training have to go before that's a better decision than by truck? So that that completely depends on, on a few things. One would be the distance of the trip, uh, the sensitivity. So that's what I'm asking for mileage. Uh, so we don't make the decision for like Basically, the way that we use this model is to is to assess the benefits of a public investment in an infrastructure project. Okay. Right. So we have no, you know, kind of purview over the decision making of a business, or how they ship, or when, or you know, how much it costs. But you want to have a good investment of the money. So if if you invest the money and then the business doesn't come, it just sits there idle. Yeah. And so in our programs, we can. Um, if we monitor the performance of the project, so if they don't meet their cargo demand, we, we can get our money back. Um, and we also uh, safeguard it from the perspective that um, we require match uh, matching funds from the private company and they have to spend their money first. In other words, it's a reimbursement based program. Um, so we kind of have some safeguards there. We monitor the projects, uh, you know, kind of performance, you know, over time. And, and we have had instances where a project hasn't met its demand and we've gotten our money back. This is purely the end user and it has nothing to do with rate or anything from the end user perspective. Correct. Yes. The commodity in question is really important. I mean, my guess is there's probably never been a truckload of coal shipped from a mine to the port of North. There's probably never close to it been truckloads of corn, soybeans, or whatever moving from Iowa. North. Those commodities will shut down right. Yeah, I mean, things that are uh, really heavy and less time sensitive, I mean, and, and a longer haul shipment, I mean, those are the ideal, uh, you know, kind of uh, set for rail travel. Good presentation. Thank you. Last item on our agenda for today is public comment. Um, we've got one is that Whitfield? Actually, made it almost on time. I'm Rob Whitfield. I'm with the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance. And I started riding double deck buses at the age of five on my own to come to school. I've been trying to get double deck buses in Virginia since 2014 when the NBTA was funded. No nearer now, Prince William County did study them. A few years ago, and may yet, may yet have. I first spoke with Jennifer the Brook, I think it was April of last year, I asked you about the freeze. I think the question I had is to me, most of the projects being considered, rail service expansion in Virginia, could be far more cost effective by expanding bus service. And um, Ace and Pine would be the new River Valley. Sorry, I don't remember the name of the town where the ladies' college is near Blacksburg. And I've sat at the table. Sorry, okay, well, I'm old fashioned, sorry. Uh, I sat at the table with the mayor of that town in April, and I don't know if I heard this morning that the, uh, the breeze has been extended to Bristol. It has, and it serves rest. And so, 
what we need and we're doing cost benefit analysis we need to see in terms of service for the crystal to the Roanoke, that whole corridor we think the journey from Roanoke goes to Dallas Airport as I recall and I think that was about four hours so here's all I'm saying it's okay that we're doing benefit cost analysis for free we we need on a high priority basis to see the bus versus rail economic comparison. I mean, I don't know what they'll be, but I would think that there are vastly more communities in Virginia with modest populations that can be served by the bus service. Uh, which brings me the other main thing. I don't think Steve is here. But I had asked him back in February and I held off on making comments because they were going to update the financial plan. And one of the problems we have is that the Long Bridge funding plan, the norm, the, the name of the overall part of Transform Rail of Virginia, for reasons certainly not known to me, may or may not be known to the, the uh, Virginia CTP, under Nick Donahue's plan. Arlington County and Alexandria are not contributing any capital costs to this $3.9 billion project. Meanwhile, the plan, as approved, I think, by the CTV two years ago, falls for up to 920 million in tolls on I-66 inside the Beltway. And the problem is that the inside the Beltway tolls are only collected on inbound commuters outside the Beltway in the morning, and the commuters going from Washington, D.C., outwards and outside the Beltway. Under a deal made with Governor Terry McCormick in North Arlington County and others, no tolls are being collected for reverse commuters. This is inequitable, and frankly, I'm opposed to any funding for any Arlington project, which includes what's before the MBTA and the MBTC, until some form of toll equity is achieved. And I don't know how and when this board will take this matter on, but I will, I will. At this point, I've held off because I've been waiting for Steve to give me an updated financial plan, which hopefully will include some federal funding and also the DC funding. Originally, DC was supposed to provide 800 million. They did the environmental assessment and impact statement. Why is it that DC hasn't been asked to pony up today? Obviously, one of the major economic beneficiaries of the Long Bridge Plan, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I don't know what it's going to take and who's going to take the initiative to do it. But as long as you propose over 900 million on tolls for the I-66 uh, commuters uh, in the next six years, count me as an opponent. I would be glad to support that project when there's an equitable financing plan. Anybody else for public comment? Well, that concludes our uh, agenda for today.